Good adventures, everybody. I'm Melissa Bonzek, and welcome to Books Cubed. This is episode 124, and we are doing prompts today. We're going to dive right in. Uh, you know my co-author, Lisa. Do you want to say hi, Lisa? <laughs> she writes short stories. She's being quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I uh, write some short stories. I finished one novel and trying to get that published, and I am guess about a third of the way through a second novel which involves ghosts so that's uh it's always fun um I read um everything but mostly what I write is more mainstream or some horror stuff or just a little bit of speculative fiction but um trying to trying to branch out which is where these prompts come in <laughs> yep yep it is and today we're join joined by Lacey Gordon if you could introduce yourself to everybody Hi, everyone. My name is Lacey Gordon. Um, I'm a multi-genre author. Um, my first published book will be in December for self-publishing under um, my publishing company I made with my husband, Ryan. It's called Rocky Road Publishing uh, LLC. And I'm also a blogger. Um, and I'm a mom of two little girls. And I have a plethora of pets. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, nice, nice. I don't have any pets at the moment, and it, I'm sad, but we have a lot of people that um, we see on our walks in the morning, um, and I write, uh, I'm Melissa Bonzak, and I write Cozy, I write Portal Fantasy, and of course, I co-author these books, and uh, in the show notes, we will have links to everybody's stuff, uh, so you can find things, and you can do these prompts on your own, so we're going to all write in horror today. We have one more person that might join us, so if he jumps in, We'll um we'll include him, but uh, we're gonna write in horror today. So Lisa, if you would just grab a prompt, and then um let Lacey know how often she needs to roll dice to find out what we're doing, and I'll write it down. Okay. And are we following the top instructions or just rolling and writing? Now nah, let's just roll and write. Just roll and write. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, you can read it, and we can. I guess we could do either. Because okay. each of the books, each of the books um, has a, a small suggested thing that you can do. Yes. So each of the books. Um, so once I, I just randomly open and there is a little bit of an instruction at the top, but it also says you can just roll it and follow your inspiration. So um, we're going to roll the first time for a character. If you could roll four of us for us, Lacey. I got number three. Number three. That is a window washer. Could roll again. Uh, number six. This is a trait, and we rolled six, which is a kleptomaniac. And our third and final roll is for a location. So if you can give me a number. Number two. In a canoe. So we have a, a window, <laughs> a window washer, a kleptomaniac, and the location is in a canoe. So let's see how we do with that. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, I'm already like, I have no clue. <laughs> okay, so I guess we will set the timer for 30 minutes. We will be back in 30 minutes. Uh, and I'll just cut all that writing part out. And let me set the timer. All done? Okay. Um, who wants to read first? All righty. So um, I'm just going to read it. I tried to fix some of the little bub ups. So here goes. <clears throat> Larry hated his job as a window washer. Matter of fact, he was afraid of heights. But after the Y2K scare, his job at the startup went away. He tried grave digging, serving, even telemarketing, but nothing stuck. His wife, Nancy, nagged and nagged. A voice squeaking in his head, get a job, get a job. He heard loser. And while she never said it aloud, he was sure she added it in her head. Her dad owned this window washing business, so she begged him to give Larry a job. The groveling and being indebted to daddy-in-law was more intolerable than climbing onto that rickety scaffolding. The best part of his stupid job was the people sometimes left their windows unlocked. He began sliding them open and creeping in, you know, just to get a break from the vertigo. Stupid rich people, they even left valuables out. So he started taking things, little things at first, an ashtray, a watch. The excitement grew. 
He wanted to see how much he could actually get away with. Emptying his coat pockets each night in the back of their bedroom closet was exhilarating. A Fabergé egg, a rare book signed by the long dead author. As the empty shoebox filled, he shuffled it all into a plastic container. Nancy once caught him removing a mantel clock and in her bitchy voice said, what? He thought quickly, oh, I found it in the garbage at one of the work sites. Let me see, she demanded it, scratching his wrist with one of her pointy fingernails. They could barely pay the utilities with his measly salary and her working part-time as a lunch lady at the elementary school down the street, but her nails got done every four weeks. Her eyes narrowed as she inspected the clock. He began sweating. Who would throw something this nice away? He shrugged. Rich people, he said matter-of-factly. She took it and put it in the living room. They, of course, didn't have a mantle, so she put it on the kitchen counter next to the toaster. When he made his English muffin each morning, he was face to face with crime. Sometimes reminded himself that it really was an amazing feat, climbing into apartments, taking things. And with the clock, he appraised himself for carrying the heavy object back out onto the scaffolding, adding way too much unnecessary weight. The objects would have to remain small going forward. After Nancy stole his steel, he decided to move the container out of their small cottage and bury the plastic container on the small patch of land across the pond. No one ever went out there. He and Nancy back when they were in love and liked hanging out together, sometimes picnicked over there, but that was years ago. That Saturday, Larry waited until Nancy's nail appointment and dragged the plastic container out back and onto, his, onto their canoe. It was a beat up old hand-me-down from who else? Daddy. He had his claws in every part of Larry's existence. As Larry rode the few hundred yards from their back patch of sand over to the island, if you could call it that, he noticed a weird glow coming from the container. Nerves propelled him faster across the water. At the patch of land, he hoisted the bucket out of the canoe, accidentally tipping its contents onto the muddy soil. The glowing brightened and flickered, sending chills up Larry's arms. Not sure he wanted to know, but knowing he had to know, Larry moved away the trinkets, tea, the smaller trinket, trinkets, teacup, watch, hair clip, fountain pen, and saw the source. It was an item he had acquired just before the mantel clock, an old Egyptian vase with faded hieroglyphics circling the base. The top was a stopper, almost like a wine bottle, but it had notches in it. When he touched it, a, warm, a, a warmth radiated onto his palm. He turned it over this way and that, the glow pulsing brighter than diminishing. As his heart pounded, he debated in his head, open it, don't, throw it in the pond, smash it to pieces. He had never been so indecisive in his life. Here he was, standing in the mud, his canoe making quiet tapping noises at the edge of the pond, Nancy's horrid voice pounding in his ears, telling him he was a chicken shit and a low-down, good-for-nothing specimen, specimen of a man. He gritted his teeth, cursed Nancy to hell, and spun the topper. Click, click, click. Three little pings. The glowing swooped outward, enveloping Poof. The container of treasures lay motionless in the mud. The, the canoe swayed. Nancy arrived home yelling as she walked through the front door about what he could possibly have wasted his day on. The empty house mocked her. Oh, <laughs> oh I like that. <laughs> um, yeah. I really like that. Oh, what? What? I got, what I got all the man. I got the window washing, the kleptomaniac, and the canoe. <laughs> oh, that's great. That is great. Um, do you, is that something you think you may work on some more? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's tropey, certainly, a container, yeah. you know. Like almost like, you know, the little magic genie, but it's, um, it's a little bit more, 
um, uh, you know, nef nefarious, you know, you don't get three wishes, but yeah, it ain't yeah. poor little Larry, but who knows? Oh, Larry. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Lacey, do you want to go or do you want me to go? I can go. That's fine. Okay. Paul laughed as he hurried to where he had hid his canoe. It sat at the bank of the large lake. He had just finished washing some windows at a cabin in the middle of nowhere for a rich couple who had gone out for the day. While he washed, he had spotted the woman's jewelry sitting on the dresser in the master bedroom. He had climbed through the window after getting it open and took not the jewelry, but the woman's sunglasses and a silk robe that laid on the bed. Next, he grabbed the man's reading glasses, his newspaper, and a few other odd items he knew he didn't need, but he couldn't help himself. He packed everything into his bag with his window washing tools and ran. Unfortunately for Paul, he had to leave his truck on the other side of the lake since there were no roads to the cabin. It was strange, as, and he had asked about it, but the couple didn't give him an answer before they had left. So all he had was the canoe they had provided. Paul dropped the bag into the canoe, climbed in, and paddled as fast as he could away from the cabin. As he paddled, a soft breeze rose from the shore and pushed back his sweaty black hair. He glanced around at the trees, startled, but nothing else moved. Paul laughed nervously and continued to paddle. He reached the middle of the lake when the breeze came back. This time, it was just strong enough to push the canoe backwards. Paul grumbled under his breath and fought against the breeze. He paddled harder and harder, but the canoe only went backwards. He glanced behind him and saw the cabin looming behind him. He panicked and tried to paddle one last time, but the canoe wouldn't obey. What is going on, he shouted. The only answer he received was the breeze in his ear, and it was getting louder. Paul grabbed the bag and tried to keep, uh, tried to leap out of the canoe and the wind grew stronger, and it grabbed up the poor man, lifting him up into the air. Paul kicked and screamed, and the bag slipped out of his hand. He looked down and watched it fall, and see, sees the lake that was several feet below him. Please, someone help me. The wind quieted da back down to the weak, small breeze, letting Paul go. He sc his screams echoed around him as he fell. It was only cut short when he hit the canoe and bounced into the water. The bag with the items he had stolen fell into the canoe, and the canoe lazily bobbed in the water until it hit the other shore. <clears throat> the front door opened, and the man of, and his wife, who owned the cabin, stepped out onto the patio. They glanced at each other and sighed, disappointed. They hadn't left, but were hiding to keep an eye on Paul, since he was a new hire. We just can't seem to find any good help these days, the woman has said as she retrieved the bag from the canoe. The man stared out at the lake where he could see Paul's body slowly getting eaten by the lake. And I had liked this one. He was funny. He looked at his wife and shrugged. They turned and returned they turned and went back into the cabin while the canoe floated back to the other side empty. Sorry, I like that. I really like that. That was good. <laughs> um, here I am talking away and I didn't have my <laughs> I turned it on mute so because sometimes I'll like oh or oh my or say something and I don't yeah I don't want to <laughs> distract. I like that they were hiding inside the cabin. I did not expect that at all. That was that was a nice twist. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I um, thought it was going to be more um, supernatural, but it, you know it was it was really more more human. But and I love that kind of tug at the beginning, like the push and the pull and the the breeze kind of, you know, pushing him forward and back. Um, I also like that he didn't take the expensive stuff. He was just doing the, the smaller in, inconvenient stuff, you know? So very good. Thank you. Still didn't help him. <laughs> Did you have a title on that one? No. Okay. Sometimes people title them. I, I never remember to title mine. Um, and mine doesn't have a title. Mine's really short as they always are. <laughs> um. The soaps were little triangles, Maisie's favorite shape. She had to take one, then three, then all five. Nobody would care. And if they did, she'd be long gone before they came back Monday morning. She leaned out around the edge of the bathroom door. The office was amazing. Dark paneled wood on the walls, leather on the furniture, crystal at the bar, and a view of the sleepy city below. 
all worthy of someone in a power in a position of power. She tiptoed over to the window, running a hand along the mahogany desk, letting her fingers wrap around the pen in the stand, lifting it out, continuing past. It had a nice weight to it, and she moved it through the air in front of her, imagining ink forming the letters in her name. As she slipped the pen into a pocket, she leaned against the cool glass to peer at the, at the street, 30 floors below. No sign of him yet, but she was a little early. She tucked a clump of auburn hair behind an ear and turned her back on the view. Did anything else need prepping? She didn't think so. Uh, let's see. Whoops, I have one line twice. She tucked a clump of hair behind an ear and considered the options. What would work best? Photographs boasted of world travel. Sports memorabilia cluttered up a dust-free shelf. A canoe was tipped in the far corner of the room. She gave the view another glance. She still had time. Padding across the room, she picked up a paddle propped to one propped to one propped to one side of the watercraft. Hmm. This would work. Back of the window, she leaned her forehead against the cool glass one more time. There he was, finally. The window washer platform slowly rising up along the outside of the building. Time to start. She raised the paddle over her head, drew in a deep breath, and released it as she lowered her arms. I reclaim what is mine, me, my wholeness. As the cable brought the platform up to her level, she took a step back and waited. He didn't notice her at first, the squeegee in one hand, the bottle of solution in the other, and for a moment her view was a distorted, soapy scene. And the squeegee was doing its thing, and the world was returning, and they were face to face, just the glass between them. His look of surprise made her smile. He tilted his head and his body, trying to see around her, finally cupping a hand against the glass, then backing up, his mouth moving, his words most likely a question, his expression disbelief. She smiled again and lifted up the paddle, one hand on the top, the other grasping at a few inches down below. And then she drove, drove it down and passed her body as if the air were water. Outside the window, the platform slammed up against the glass. The man grabbed the railing and let out a silent shout. She just smiled and reversed the motion of the paddle. This time, the platform swung away from the building. She rushed up to the window in time to see one of the man's feet slip into empty air. She waited to make eye contact one more time. She wanted to make sure he recognized her, that he knew who was doing this to him. As he gripped the railing of the platform, she wished she could have opened the window, asked him what he thought about her now, if he regretted laughing at her when she told him she'd get even. But she supposed it really didn't matter. She backed away from the window. She'd need more work, more room to work. The paddle did its thing. The platform began to rock wildly. It probably wouldn't take but a few more swings to finish him off. Then she'd go back down the service elevator and no one would ever know she'd been there. Maybe she'd check the little fridge over in the corner. This kind of thing always gave her an appetite. I like that you you switched it up and the you that your protagonist wasn't the window washer, but he was who she was going to get even with. I really like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I always think it's fun getting that prompt and then seeing what everybody does with it. I don't because think I'm a window washer anymore. Yeah. yeah everybody's <laughs> different. <laughs> I can't imagine being a window washer. I, I have fear of heights. So, oh, yeah. But you got some nice details in there, the squeegee and the, and you're using the paddle from the canoe. And yeah, that was, uh, had some good details. I liked it. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, I can definitely uh, see it swinging in my head and it's just, it freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, that was a hard one to get into. You guys really jumped in and, and wrote quite a bit. So I'm always impressed. But Did uh, yours... Um, we had, uh, Lacey had Paul, I had Larry. What was your, did your protagonist have a name? Um, yeah, I think she did. Hang on, let me look again. Um, Maisie. Oh, Maisie, right, right, right. Yes, I like that. Or Maxie, one of the two. <laughs> I wrote Maxie, Maxie, not Maisie, Maxie. Do you know why she was getting revenge on him? Did he turn her down for a date? I don't know. Or? I don't know. She just, she's angry. <laughs> He did something. Who knows? <laughs> um, but he won't do it again. Oh, gracious. Uh, yeah, this was really good. This was good, guys. Um, everybody wrote an interesting story. Uh, are you going to do anything more with yours, Lacey? I don't know. Not sure yet. I have to play with it first, maybe. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just have to set them aside. And sometimes they will um, 
lead to other ideas. You know, um, one thing that I, we, we were at, Lisa and I did a show, uh, Wizards, Witches, and the Weird in Daytona a few weeks ago. And one mm -hmm. of the things we were telling people when they were rolling for prompts was, you know, sometimes you get stuck in that middle section of your book and you don't know where to go. And so sometimes just taking your characters and actually the scene that you're in and then rolling the dice and just, you know, writing a scene right where you're stuck with your characters will sometimes open up um, possibilities uh, that you hadn't thought about before. And sometimes it's just a good way to get your brain going again, because that middle third or that middle section is the worst. <laughs> it, can, it can be a drag for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They don't call it the muddy middle for nothing. <laughs> oh, I know. Let's see. Lacey, do you have a website? Um, I do. Rocky Road publishing um dot org if that's the way my husband set it up let me check real fast okay well i'll double check well when i'm writing up you can send me a note um uh i'll get the show notes all written up and get this live on thursday okay. yeah it is rocky road uh publishing dot org okay so you have a mailing list people can get on to get your work uh not yet i am still working on that part um uh the only like uh email right now I have is with my blogging, uh, which is blogging with Um That's the only way to, for the emails and everything right now. Um, but I am still working on that. So I, I hopefully I'm hoping it'll be set up soon. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. I'll make sure that that is in the show notes and uh, people can find these. And uh, of course we have uh, 13 books now, I think in this series. So if uh, anybody's looking for genres, we have, um, what do we have, Lisa? What are the genres? <laughs> uh, romance, mystery, horror, um, sci-fi, fantasy, and then there's a mashup. So those are the first six. And then in the second grouping, we, we went away from genres and we are just doing kind of story writing elements. So we have conflict, the five senses, language um character is coming out um that's one two three four so we're missing what are we missing we have um, a scene did you say scenes no so maybe yeah so scene conflict five senses language and then characters coming out and then our last one will be world building, world building. yeah and then we oh. have two teachers edition if you homeschool or <laughs> Um, teach. Uh, we have editions that have three. One, the first edition has mystery, romance, and genre mashup, and the second one is horror, fantasy, and sci-fi. And each has been formatted for and edited for students with bell work and classroom games and that kind of thing. So um, we sell a lot of those to teachers and homeschoolers. So those are fun. You'll find those on the website, and I'll have links to everything. And uh, this was fun, ladies. Thank you guys for letting me be a part of it. It was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so glad you you commented on, um, I think you commented on one of the ads we had on Facebook. It was for the uh, Facebook for the role, the role of prom, uh, horror book. Yeah, I try to stay on top of comments. We get a lot of comments. So um, in fact, I need to go on online and look because I've been gone for a week and I haven't looked at anything. So just in case anybody's commented in the last week, I will get back to you. Thank you, everybody, for being on. And Lacey gets an, an ebook copy of one of our books. So uh, she said that language, which is coming out in a week, probably a week. So I'll be sending her one of those. So if you are interested in coming on the show, uh, just drop um, a note to mel at melissabonzac.com and you can find the address in the show notes. Uh, written down because nobody knows how to spell my name, <laughs> including me. <laughs> so <laughs> I was subbing a second grade class one time and this little second grader said, I think you spelled your name wrong. And yeah, I had. So I'm like, oh yeah, I did. What do you know? So, um, so yeah. Okay. Well, thank you ladies for coming on today and uh, uh, good adventures to everybody. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.